Um, welcome back. So our uh, next speaker is Pavel uh, Safronov. He will tell us about virtual fundamental classes and BV quantization from supersymmetric twists. Thanks for the invitation. And sorry, I couldn't have been there uh, in person. So I want to talk about uh, some joint work with Brian Williams, who is in the audience. Um, and the work consists of two papers. One of them is an archive uh, and the other one is still in progress. So there's um, two keywords. There's BB quantization that's in the first paper and virtual fundamental classes that's in the second paper. And uh, the first paper has already appeared and the second one is still work in progress. Okay, so um, basically what I want to explain in this talk is um, some rigorous models for various uh, partition functions and uh, Hilbert spaces in supersymmetric theories with enhanced supersymmetry. So I'll say later what I mean by enhanced supersymmetry and how much supersymmetry I'd actually need. Um, the idea is that uh, th there has been some developments in the last uh, five years or so in derived geometry. And I want to explain how uh, certain partition functions and Hilbert spaces can be computed using those developments in derived geometry. So I'll give a more or less uh, direct way to go from physics uh, to some rigorous models for these. And as two main motiv uh, motivating examples, uh, I want to talk about these two. So the first one is, if you look at eight-dimensional equals one super gamma mills, uh, it admits a topological twist, so you can put it on a curved space time. And if you put it on a Calabi-Yau fourfold, it has enough supersymmetry to run this machine. And I will explain how to get um, or how to write down a certain um, precise expression, which will be the partition function of this super gamma mills. And uh, for the Hilbert space, uh, here's another example. If you look at seven dimensional super gamma mills, and um, again, again, it admits a topological twist, so you can put it on curved space times. And I'm going to look at the space time of the form Calabi out threefold, which is something six dimensional cross R. Um, so let's say maybe Calabi out threefold is X. So I'm, I'm looking at the space time X cross R. Uh, and so I can consider the Hilbert space on the space time. And again, there will be a model uh, for this uh, uh, Hilbert space in the topological twist in terms of derived geometry. Um, well, the main problem when you're trying to do this calculations of partition functions is that, um, well, if you have theories with uh, enough supersymmetry, you can apply supersymmetric localization to reduce to some fine dimensional problem. But that fine dimensional problem, um, you have to integrate over something singular. And so it's usually unclear what, how, to, how to make sense of that. And I will just explain uh, how one can make sense of those kind of integrals using the right geometry. Okay, let me begin with a very um, basic example, which is going to be very important. So this is a zero dimensional supersymmetric theory, meaning the space time is just a point. So there's no space time. Um, and so really there's just the target space, which is uh, what I call M. Okay, and to define this uh, N equals one, what I call N equals one sigma model, um, well, I have to choose, first of all, a manifold M, which is my target. On that manifold, there is a real vector bundle. So that's where the fermions will live. Uh, that vector bundle comes with uh, by symmetric bilinear form and a connection. And there's also a section of the vector bundle, alpha. Okay, so uh, the fields are, so the bosonic fields, 
uh, are just given by maps into the target space. So here, the source is just a point, so it's just an element of the target. And the two fermions uh, are given by a vector field and uh, a section of the, of the vector bundle. Uh, so I'm not going to write the supersymmetry, but you can, you can guess, um, yeah, you can imagine what it might be. So maybe let me just write two obvious ones, delta phi is chi, delta chi is zero, and then delta psi uh, has a slightly more complicated expression, but not too difficult. Okay, um, and um, uh, then you can write down the action functional for this uh, toy model. So maybe some of you have seen this action functional. Um, okay, so I will not, maybe not comment on this action functional, but I, what I want to say is that if you want to write down the partition function, so I will just schematically write integral d phi, d chi, d psi, e to the s, maybe i s, well, to compute this partition function, you first integrate over psi. And what you discover is this formula for the partition function in terms of integral of some differential form. This differential form is exactly um, the Euler class that appears in the Matai-Kilman formalism. So if you, if you integrate over, so, so I first integrate over the psi fields, then I reduce to some integral over phi and chi, which just combine into integral of differential forms over the man manifold. Okay, so the upshot is that uh, the answer is the integral of some explicit differential form, the differential form, this Matai Quillen Euler class. Uh, whatever it, it is, uh, it has the same cohomology class as the usual Euler class. Um, but the reason it's nice is that it localizes the Euler class to the zero section of alpha. Okay. And so one way, uh, if, if, if you think now about this localization, uh, one way to write down this partition function is just Integral over the zero locus of the the one form uh, of the of the section alpha of a certain fundamental class of X. Well, th this makes sense if uh, X is actually a, a smooth manifold. Then um, this formula make, makes sense. But if X is not a smooth, smooth manifold, you have to do something. Okay, and then there are three main problems to make sense of this partition function. Uh, one of them is non-compactness of X. Uh, I will not say much about this problem. Uh, I will not be able to resolve it in any other way. The second one is uh, you have to integrate over the fermions, over psi. And for this, you need to choose an orientation on E. Otherwise, there's going to be an anomaly. OK, and the final uh, issue is the one I already mentioned that uh, to properly make sense of this, you want X to be a smooth manifold. So for instance, you can perturb alpha uh, so that the intersection of, al of the graph of alpha and the zero section is transverse. Okay. And if the intersection is transverse, then this is just going, X is just going to be a collection of points and then the partition function will be just the usual count. Okay, so this is a very classic, uh, classic story. And now if you have a higher dimensional supersymmetric theory and you, you, you consider it on a curved space time and you apply a topological twist, then uh, hopefully you will have uh, at least one supersymmetry. And so the compactified theory will be of this form, except M will be infinite dimensional uh, and E will be also an infinite dimensional electron. Uh, but the idea is that even though E and M are infinite dimensional, the zero locus might in some sense be finite dimensional. Okay, and so really we don't want to think, 
of the partition function in this way, because it's infinite dimensional. And really we want to think about the partition function as the integral of some fundamental class of the zero locus. So that's the supersymmetric localization. Okay. So this is the zero dimensional example. Um, and the one dimensional example uh, is very similar. So this is just supersymmetric quantum mechanics, uh, like in Witten's paper. So in this case, I choose a Riemannian manifold uh, and I have a closed one form. So for instance, this one form might be exact. Uh, and then you can look at uh, the Hilbert space in the topological twist. So that means I look at the cohomology of the Hilbert space with respect to um, the differential Q. where Q is my supercharge. And uh, Witten explains that this Hilbert space uh, should be thought of as more homology of H. More generally, if uh, you actually have a closed one form, not, uh, not an action form, not, not just uh, the potential H, then you want to look at uh, what's called Novikov homology. Okay, and again, if, if you're really uh, interested in Hilbert spaces for higher dimensional supersymmetric theories, then what you do is you, you have a higher dimensional theory, you compactify it on uh, co-dimension one submanifold and you get supersymmetric quantum mechanics. But again, as before, there are problems. Uh, this manifold is usually infinite dimensional. Uh, and so really you want to replace this manifold, this infinite dimensional manifold uh, by the critical locus of H. So in some sense, you want to uh, reduce your, th uh, your calculation to something fine dimensional in terms of the critical locus of the potential, but the critical locus of the potential might be something uh, very singular. Okay, again, uh, there are two problems similar to how uh, you've had these problems in, in zero dimensions. So if the manifold is not compact, so, which is usually the case uh, in infinite dimensions, um, then the Morse differential will not necessarily square to zero. Okay. And the second example is, uh, the, the second problem is that well, if H is really not a Morse function, then it's not clear what you mean by Morse homology. So at least uh, the critical locus should be should consist of isolated points. Okay. Um, anyone to consider an example of uh, yeah how you uh, get an example of this twisted Hilbert space? So let's consider a pure uh, 4D equals two square gamma mills with some gauge group G. Um, so this is a pure theory. Uh, this theory has a topological twist, which is called the Donaldson twist. So this was considered in the original paper written on topological twists. So I can put it on curved space time and I consider my space time to be uh, some three manifold cross R. So now I can compactify this four dimensional theory on this, uh, on this manifold N and I get uh, just a supersymmetric mechanics on R. Uh, in this case, you have supersymmetric mechanics on R uh, into the space of connections uh, on, on the three manifold N. And H, uh, the, this potential is going to be the churn simons functional. Okay, and then if you look at the critical locus of the churn simons functional, 
So the space of all connections is infinite dimensionals, but uh, infinite dimensional, but the critical log is, is fine dimensional. So this is the space of flat connections. Hegel connection, if you have the chunks and unchunks, do that. Is it explicit or is this mathematical? I'm sorry, could you say it again? When you do this, do you really do you get explicitly an action with the chance and then term, or it's just a mathematical statement that you have to obtain this? No, this this is a uh, this is a precise calculation you can, you can do. Um, I forget at the moment uh, who has done this, but it, it's 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 been done in the early nineties. This kind of calculation. So you just write. Um, yeah, n equals two super gamma mills. Um, apply the, the twist and rewrite everything in terms of maps from R into something in terms of M. And re you really get super semantic mechanics, uh, and then you see the potential in the action. Or, for instance, if you, if you just un unpack the supersymmetries because the potential appears in the supersymmetries. Yeah, so, so in, in this case, H will be literally the transcendence action function. Um, okay, so in this case, the critical locus will be the space of flat connections um, on N. And this is in some sense a finite dimensional object. Um, it, it's not quite clear what you're supposed to do with this finite dimensional object uh, in this case. Um, but uh, people have made sense of this twisted Hilbert space, namely Fleur defined instant Fleur homology uh, of the three manifold N, which is supposed to be the Morse homology uh, of the transcendence function. Okay, so this is a fairly classical story. And this is what I would mean when you have a minimal amount of supersymmetry after the quantification. So what I want to talk about next is what happens when you have more supersymmetry. So things will simplify, first of all. And second, you will actually be able to, um, to write answers in terms of these fine dimensional models. OK, so let me begin by uh, explaining supersymmetry enhancement in zero dimensions. OK. so. To define this n equals one sigma model, I said that I choose a real vector bundle with a bilinear form and a connection. Now let, let's assume that if you look at this vector bundle, you complexify it. So you get the script E, what I call. And you look at the zero one part of the connection, this is actually a holomorphic structure. So in other words, uh, the zero one part of the connection defines a holomorphic structure. Vector bundle, um, and uh, right. I forgot to say that actually M is also supposed to be um, complex manifold in this case. And uh, the last thing is that I had this section of the real vector bundle E. And I want this section to actually be the real part of a holomorphic section of the complexified bundle. OK, so you have this beta, which is a section of the complexified bundle. Uh, its real part has to be the original section alpha. And also this, this new section, the holomorphic section, has to be isotropic. Um, so uh, beta, beta, the pairing is 0. So in this case, you can write down uh, two commuting supercharges. Uh, and some linear combination of those will give you the original n equals 1 supercharge. OK. Now, in this case, you get n equals 2 supersymmetry. So one thing you get is uh, extended. Um, so once you have extended supersymmetry, you have R symmetry. Okay. 
In this case, the R symmetry group is SO2. And using this R symmetry, you can actually endow the space of fields with a grading. Um, because I'm talking about SO2, I actually need to complexify the space of fields. Um, so I, I now consider it complexified space of fields. And instead of being a super manifold, so instead of fields being just Z2 graded, R symmetry enhances the Z2 grading to a Z grading. And second, uh, the second fact, which is uh, might sound a little bit random at the moment, is just an observation that this complexified space of fields carries the symplectic structure. So if you write down the complexified space of fields, uh, basically you'll see something that looks like uh, essentially the cotangent bundle of M and then uh, there's going to be E in degree uh, minus one. So uh, the cotangent bundle has a symplectic structure um, because I, I consider a cotangent bundle where the cotangent uh, fibers have certain natural degree, the symplectic structure will have a degree minus two. And fermions were uh, lived in this orthogonal vector bundle, which I put in, in an odd degree. So it, it, it's going to give me an even symplectic structure. OK, so this is going to be a symplectic structure of degree minus 2. OK, so that's, that's the first fact. And the second fact, uh, it's again, so far it looks like a random observation, is that Actually, you can go back. So if you have any minus two shifted symplectic manifold, so more precisely, this statement has been proven in the sending valve break geometry. So you, you consider minus two shifted symplectic uh, derived scheme. Then there's a Darboux theorem for those. And the Darboux theorem says that locally, every minus two shifted symplectic manifold is of this form. So in other words, you have a smooth manifold M or a smooth scheme M. You have a vector bundle E with, um, <clears throat> with an orthogonal structure. You have a section which is isotropic and so on. So exactly this structure. Um, well, and the, the, the natural question is, OK, uh, you look at the space of fields. It has, a, it has some symplectic structure. First of all, it's an even symplectic structure. Uh, so that's somewhat unusual because I'm just talking about something in zero dimensions. If you think about the banal Vilkovsky formalism, you would expect an all symplectic structure. So this is something different. Well, and then, uh, yeah, natural question is, is it useful for anything? Can you use this uh, shift the symplectic structure to say something about the, the theorem? Well, the answer I want to explain is that actually, yes, um, this shift the symplectic structure is what will be used to um, give rigorous models. OK. Um, any questions so far? All right. Um, let me briefly mention an analogous picture in one dimension. So in one dimension, I had a Riemannian manifold to get n equals 2 supersymmetry. So this was n equals 1d n equals 2 supersymmetry. And now if you, if you have not just Riemannian manifold, but a Kähler structure, and moreover, the, the potential h, is a real part of some holomorphic uh, function. Let's call it W. Then in this case, uh, supersymmetry enhances from n equals 2 to n equals 4. So again, you, you can just write uh, four, four supercharges. And then some linear combination of those will give rise to the original uh, two supercharges. OK, so the upshot is that you, what you have in this context is you have 
uh, Kähler manifold, or let's just think about complex manifold, M, and uh, a holomorphic function. W. Um, again, as I said, uh, the super symmetric localization you want to do is to the critical locus of W. So you want to replace this data M and W, which is some infinite dimensional gadget. To uh, you want to replace it by the critical locus of W, which is something fine dimensional. Now the critical locus of W um, can be enhanced to a, a derived object. So if you think about batalin kolbisky formalism, uh, this precisely gives you a derived object. The derived object has uh, a symplectic structure. This derived critical locus. The symplectic structure has degree minus one. So if you invert it, you get a Poisson bracket of degree plus one, and that's the batalin kolbisky anti-bracket. Okay, so maybe let me summarize what happens. Uh, what happened in the supersymmetric en enhancement in zero dimensions? Um, the complexified space of fields um, carried a minus two shifted symplectic structure, so uh, symplectic structure of degree minus two. And in this one-dimensional case, uh, you get a minus one shifted symplectic structure. Okay, so next I want to explain what one can do with these and how this uh, relates to um, uh, to, origin, uh, to the original physical problem. Uh, before I do that, I want to explain uh, from physics why the space of fields actually carry some uh, kind of symplectic structure in zero and one dimensions. Oh, the idea is the following. So let's look at uh, zero this n equals two supersymmetry algebra in zero dimensions. So, so that just means you have so the supersymmetry algebra in this case is um, just the odd um, the odd abelian Lie algebra uh, of dimension two. And so in this case, you have a family of supercharges. So this is the family of lines inside of C2. So you get CP1 family of supercharges. Okay, and then you can consider twists with respect to any of that uh, supercharge in that family. Now, if you analyze this family, um, this family will have a special point which is simpler than the others. At the special point, uh, so for, for some special value, uh, for some special supercharge, what you get is uh, an analog of the BF theory in zero dimensions. So what I mean by that is if you look at the space of BB fields or complexified BB fields, then you just get a minus one shift cotangent bundle of something. Okay, so for instance, uh, if you imagine that you have a theory with the zero action functional, then the space of BB fields will be like that. So this is a particular simple example of uh, BB theory. Okay, so this is what happens uh, at the special point. And then you can deform away from the special point uh, by considering a family uh, of twists. Now, if you deform the theory, well, that means that you need to deform this space, or in other words, you need to, do, to add a uh, non-trivial action function on this. Okay, so an action functional on, on this space, well, it's going to be a function of degree zero on this space. 
Okay, but function on the space is just a polar vector field on, on, on the base, on F. Okay, so what you get is a polar vector field on F, and then the classical master equation uh, for this action functional. So you want the deformation to still be a DV theory. So the classical, uh, the classical master equation tells you that this Poisson bracket, so this, this polar vector field is actually integrable. So this polar vector field will actually be a Poisson bracket. And if you look at the shifts, uh, it, it will be a degree two by vector. So it's gonna be a minus two shift of the Poisson structure. So degree of pi is as a bivector is two. So it's a minus two shift of the symplectic structure. Okay. So basically the upshot is that uh, th this is a, some kind of secondary structure to the usual BV structure in the presence of extended supersymmetry when you have this family of twists. You can also do this um, in <laughs> one dimensions. So in one dimensions, you have n equals four supersymmetry. So th that means the odd part um, is four dimensional and the even part is one dimensional. Um, if you look at the space of supercharges, so it's the space of lines in C4. Um, so the space of lines in C4 is CP3, and then you want to look at square zero supercharges. So that's going to be a quadric in CP3, so that's CP1 cross CP1. Okay, and then you can again repeat the similar stories. There's going to be um, a class of superchargers which are particularly simple, which give where, uh, for instance, the classical phase space. So in this case, phase space will be simple. T star of something, let's call it again, complex right fields. And then deformations of that will be given by a function on the space uh, satisfying classical master equation. So that's again going to give you a Poisson structure, but that Poisson structure has degree one because this is an ordinary cohangible. Okay. <laughs> Let me again pause for questions uh, because next I will uh, switch gears and talk about derived geometry. Can I ask maybe a naive question on that? Yeah. Um, is there just one special point here? Because normally I think of, I could imagine, for example, that there's like a C star action, um, but then there would be two fixed points of that C star action, like a C P one. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think indeed that there are two special points. Um, the two special points correspond to basically uh, they give you essentially the same space, except one of them has complex structure uh, with a minus sign. Okay. So it's corresponds to two uh, two choices of the complex structure, J and minus J. Okay, perfect. And so the, those are both of the S type, and then in between you get something. Exactly. Yeah, so you could deform, maybe you can imagine that uh, at the other pole, you also have kind of anti-homomorphic BF, yes. and then you can deform from the other side as well. Good question. All right. So let me talk about derived geometry now. Okay, so what did I want to do? Uh, so I had this uh, vector bundle. So the E was a uh, real orthogonal vector bundle. Uh, there was a connection and so on, and there was a section alpha. Okay. 
And then I want to apply some kind of supersymmetric localization to reduce uh, this integral of the Euler class of E. I want to reduce that to just the integral over the zero section. Um, and of course, the, the main problem is that this um, intersection of alpha with the zero section might not be a smooth manifold. So um, the intersection is not transverse. <coughs> what I said is that in, in the case that I'm talking about, when I have extended supersymmetry, actually, so this was uh, this complexified space of fields before. I have a minus two shift symplectic structure on the space of fields. And then given any minus two shift symplectic structure, minus two shift symplectic scheme, there, were, there was a sequence of works um, defining the notion of virtual fundamental class in this context. This virtual fundamental class, th this is, is something for a, so this is a complex symplectic scheme. And the way they do this, at least Boris and Joyce do that, is they extract a real, um, a real vector bundle with a real section. So essentially, they, um, the way they define this virtual fundamental class is precisely using real model like this. OK. So it's some class in. Um, in homology of X, the, the degree of the homology class is the, the virtual dimension of X. And this homology, um, well, I, I said it's, it's the borel mohr homology. So lo locally finite chains. And then, for instance, if X is compact, then you can integrate this virtual fundamental class and you can get a number. So the upshot is that whenever you have um, extended supersymmetry in zero dimensions, <coughs> then close to supersymmetry. So you, you start with some higher dimensional uh, field theory compactified down to zero dimensions. And suppose you, your space, space time is such that you have extended supersymmetry. Then you get a sigma model of the type I mentioned. Uh, and then on complexified space of fields, you get a minus two shift symplectic structure. And then you can define the partition function to be just the integral of the virtual fundamental class of Boris of Joyce, freedom, and O to compass. Okay, and the idea is that in all the examples uh, of twists of at least supersymmetric gauge theories, so twists. So whenever you actually have this extended supersymmetry, this uh, complexified space of fields is actually is a finite dimensional uh, minus two shifted symplectic. Uh, it happens to be stack, but that's maybe irrelevant to the talk. Uh, the key word here is finite dimensional. So in, in fact, uh, after supersymmetric localization, you can actually uh, make this definition, and this is something that's probably defined. OK, and again, let me just repeat the original idea is that um, one way to make sense of this virtual fundamental class is to perturb the section so that the intersection of the section with the zero section is transverse. And here, instead of per perturbing the section, you, you just remember the, right, the derived structure. And then you can still define this virtual fundamental class. OK. So, so this is the story of how you define a partition function in zero dimensions. Uh, and I want to just mention a similar story in one dimension. 
Okay, and again, uh, so, so we want to talk about somehow Morse homology for a function which is not Morse. In our case, M is some complex manifold. And W is a homomorphic function. And then the potential is the real part of this homomorphic function. Um, so uh, as I said, you, I, I want to reduce from this data of M and W, which is where M is usually in something infinite dimensional like the space of all connections to the finite dimensional model, which is the critical locus. And now the critical locus has a shapeless symplectic structure. Find dimensional minus one shifted. Symplectic scheme. Okay. Now, just uh, purely in derived geometry, uh, Joyce with collaborators, they have defined a certain perverse sheave. So it's a complex of sheaves for any minus one shift symplectic scheme. And the idea of this complex is that whatever more homology might be uh, in this uh, homomorphic context, when H is the real part of a homomorphic function, it's gonna localize as a sheave uh, on the critical locus. So in other words, there are no, uh, no instant corrections, that there's nothing connecting uh, different critical points in this context. So in, in the paper we, uh, with Brian, we uh, give more motivation for this proposal. Um, so why that, that's the right Hilbert space by connecting this to DV quantization. Uh, but let me not say that unless there are questions. And so the, the upshot is that Again, in this case, uh, you look at the critical locus. The critical locus uh, of W will be will have this uh, minus one shift the symplectic structure. So you can define the cohomology of this perverse sheaf, and that's the answer for the twisted Hilbert space in the supersymmetric mechanics. And in this case, uh, you could, uh, again. If, if you're just trying to, to make sense of Morse homology, to define Morse homology, you have to um, fix the issues of compactness, because then if the space is non-compact, the differential might not square to zero, and then transversality. So if the function is not Morse, then the Morse complex is just not defined. Uh, but in this, in, in this case, it, it's just, um, yeah, it, it, it always makes sense if X is actually Find the dimension. All right. So I want to end with some examples. Uh, so let me begin with some examples of twisted Hilbert space you get uh, from this construction. I want to explain that those twisted Hilbert spaces actually relate to something that's, um, that was known in, in the math literature. Okay, so, so the first example is let's look at uh, maximum supersymmetric Young and Mills in four dimensions. So there are many topological twists, and I'm, I'm going to consider what's called the buffer Witten twist. Uh, and that's the same for the purpose of the Hilbert space, that's the same as the twist considered by Marcus or Patterson Witten. Okay, and then you can compactify it uh, on a three manifold to get to get the supersymmetric mechanics. So the story is very similar to the case of the insulin floor homology that I started with, uh, where you, you instead of looking at n equals four, you look at the n equals two supersymmetric gain mills. In that case, you get supersymmetric quantum mechanics into the space of G connections, and the potential was given by the Chern-Simons functional. 
Now, instead of G connections, you look at complexified connections and the potential is the complexified transcendence function. Uh, so this is the calculation we do in the paper. Um, and then, um, yeah, you, you, then you can con con compute the critical locus of this complexified transcendence functional. And that's the space of flat GC connections. This space is a very nice uh, fine dimensional minus one shifted symplectic scheme or a stack in this case. And so you can define um, you, you can define a twisted Hilbert space via the proposal I mentioned on the previous slide. So it's the cohomology of this perverse sheaf on the critical locus, which is the space of flat connections. This cohomology was considered in the math literature. Uh, it was defined maybe about three years ago by Abuzid and Manolescu. They call it complexified instant floor cohomology. So the idea is that it's precisely a complexification of the Enkels two story, where you get the usual instant floor homology. Okay. Um, so another example is um, if you look at something in seven dimensions. So if you look at seven dimensional supergam mills, you can compactify it on Calabi out threefold, and again you will have extend the supersymmetry. In this case, the, the story is very similar to the first example, uh, except you replace the usual transcendence functional by the holomorphic transcendence functional. So W will be holomorphic transcendence functional. And then again, um, you can formulate the Silver space as the cohomology of this perverse sheaf on the moduli space of holomorphic bundles. Um, this cohomology of this perverse sheaf is exactly what uh, what is known as categorified Donaldson Thomas invariant. Uh, so this was again defined by um, in 2012 by Kim Lee and Joyce with collaborators. Okay, so the final thing I want to mention is uh, one example of a partition function, again, using Dirac geometry. So let's consider eight dimensional supergam mills. Uh, again, you can consider a topological twist of that and you can put it in Calabi L fourfold. If you can back to it in Calabi L fourfold, in zero dimensions, you will have n equals two supersymmetry. In this case, uh, this complexified space of fields, you can compute that. And that's gonna be, again, the moduli of holomorphic bundles. So this is moduli space of holomorphic bundles. On this Calabi L fourfold. And this is again a nice uh, minus two shifted. A symplectic stack. And then if you uh, restrict to maybe stable bundles, so that you actually get a scheme, then you can define the partition function by comp computing integral of the virtual fundamental class. And this is what was defined by Tsao Lung, which is called the DT4 theory. So it's the Donaldson Thomas theory for Calabi L fourfolds. Uh, they defined it using differential geometry, and then uh, this work of Boris of Joyce and the others uh, was an attempt to define it using uh, derived geometry. Okay, but the upshot is that this uh, Donaldson Thomas invariant for Calabi L fourfolds is exactly the partition function of eight dimensional spring mills. So I'll stop here, thanks. Well, thank you very much. Any questions? There's a question.
question in the, uh, uh, in the Zoom. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I have a question about the potential. Uh, in the minus one shaded case, as you explained, uh, the, the local structure, local double theorem that uh, gives uh, the structure of the, um, of the manifold as a uh, critical locus. And then uh, there is this perverse shift of uh, vanishing cycles that uh, is so important. Uh, in the minus two uh, case, uh, the situation is uh, uh, slightly different. There is a globally defined potential, but it is not a function. It is a section of a real bundle, the dual bundle to the one. So my question is, um, given this global potential in the minus two shifted case, is there any kind of uh, role for it uh, the way that uh, this uh, uh, W in your case uh, that you were describing plays in the case of minus one shifted structure? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't thought about that. That's, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't know. These are, at the end, this is an integer, right? Um, in the case of a, um, um, uh, maybe it's it's something, um, uh, maybe a rational number. I thought in the bits of DT variant, uh, if you have a scheme, then it's an integer and it's exactly a rational number, but. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's uh, currently it's it, it's it's something uh, like it, uh, you, you have to adjoin uh, one half. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't think the fundamental class uh, is in the integer homology. At, at least in the O. Thomas approach, they. Um, they have to divide by two somewhere. My, my question is whether there's a way to see this from your formalism or whether this is something you only know because you can compare it with other definitions. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say uh, it falls at, at least. It's un unclear uh, from what I said. Uh, of course, the idea is that you should be able to perturb this section and get a transverse intersection, and then you would just count, you would get a signed count of points. That would be an integer. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, if there are no other questions, questions in the Zoom. Then uh, um, let us thank Pavel again for his talk. for visiting. Uh, stick around for the next talk, of course. Um.